everybody. Welcome to round 58 of the WBC Talks. This time we're going to have historians. Uh, first, let me introduce Sochi Lagarda. She's the director of the WBC University with a great message for you. Sochi, how are you? Uh, fine, Victor. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jill. Hi. Hello. Bruce, well, round 58. In again. <laughs> it's exciting to to see the numbers all the time. Today is Monday, a new week has begun. In many countries, we still are in an emergency call and in some others, life is beginning to go back to normality in the new reality. The only truth is that everybody has a different reality and every individual is facing what is happening in their own way. And because of that, it is important to keep our mental health in good shape. We must train our mind and our spirit every day and never don't let our guard down. Adversity is part of, of life now more than ever. There are only, uh, there are two ways to approach adversity. The first one is to let ourselves to be carried away by uncertainty. And the other one we can see, we can see it has a positive attitude and try to find a purpose in what is happening. What have we learned until now with almost three months of quarantine? Ask the question to yourself and make a reflection. Maybe have you become or have we become more resilient. Maybe we have developed the ability to overcome a situation with a positive attitude and come out of it reinforced and learn something from it. Well, there are always aspects that we could have reinforced in this quarantine stage. Maybe we have uh, learned the importance of time. Some things that you consider important are still important at this time. Maybe you have learned knowing uh, your emotions, understanding what is normal has normal and experiencing the emotions you experience is totally normal, okay? Maybe we have uh, learned to improve tolerance to frustration. Frustration, it's a very common uh, viable, which is why uh, we need to reinforce the stage that we're living right now. We, we don't have to stop uh, like reflection, thinking about what is happening and try to do the better of it every day. We don't know for how much long longer this stage is going to go on. Reality is different for everybody of us in every country, every city. So we must keep uh, doing the best of ourselves and trying to be positive on what is happening right now. Uh, I hope that you have a great week. Today it's Monday, like we say, and we still have uh, five talks, five panels to go during this week. Thank you very much, Victor. Go ahead. Thank you, Thank you Sochi. And now let me welcome Jill Diamond. Hello, Victor. Jill, oh, how are you? Always a pleasure. The weather is nice in New York and I feel that it's starting to open up a little bit. So that gives me some hope. So you're walking your dog again? Always walking the dog, but now I'm walking the dog with construction workers on the block. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in the phase one. That's great. You can hear them in the background. I've closed all the windows but one. If you need me to, I'll close the second one. No, it's OK. <clears throat> and now let me introduce Jack Hurst. Jack is a former six-term president of Boxing Writers Association of America and 2020 inductee in the New York State Boxing Hall of Fame. Jack, how are you? Uh, very good, Victor. And I'm so glad to be on this show. It's extra special to me because the last few days, I would have been in Canastota, New York, for the International Boxing Hall of Fame festivities. And it's a big highlight of the year. But because of the pandemic, it had to get canceled. So normally, I'd be on the road driving home at this point. But 
coming on this show, you know, I get the feel of boxing, the involvement, and I'm looking around and I see, you know, a couple of potential Hall of Famers for Canastota, you know, on the screen now. And that doesn't include Mauricio himself, you know, who I'm sure is going to be in someday. It's uh, usually at this time we all meet there, but I hope next year is going to be as double as fun. And this year, with Christy Martin being nominated on her birthday, she is just so upset about it, but she's been promised a great ceremony next year. But how often does that happen? First woman on her birthday, International Boxing Hall of Fame. Well, next year it's going to be off the charts because they're going to have two classes of Hall of Famers. So when they combine them together, it's going to be maybe the most exciting time up there yet. I hope so. And now uh, also Laurie Goldman, Goldberg is here with us. Is the owner of and publisher of Boxing Insider and Boxing Insider Podcast. Larry, yeah. welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Pleasure is all mine. Silver Glade. Bruce. Hi. Everybody knows you. Well, everybody knows Bruce. That, that just means I'm old. Every, I've been around <laughs> so long that everybody, everybody now knows me. But no, that, that means you're famous. Oh, I, <laughs> famous, famous. I just sit here. But Larry knows. Larry comes, Larry trains here. He's one of my uh, fellows. We're waiting to come back. When, when are you opening up? Do you know? No, I don't. I'm arguing now. That's one of the points I'm going to make this morning. Uh, I'm arguing with the uh, with the governor, and I can't get an answer. Uh, no one really knows when uh, when gyms will open. Uh, but my uh, my point that I'm trying to make <clears throat> is that the governor has allowed professional uh, athletes to train. He's allowing basketball players. Uh, the uh, Brooklyn Nets are only a mile away, and they're allowed to train in their gym. Obviously, the baseball players are are uh, able to train. Uh, but professional fighters are not. Uh, so the professional fighters are being discriminated against, and I don't know why, uh, other than the fact that we don't have proper representation. <laughs> but um, uh, I have a fellow that's fighting on ESPN in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand this, uh, this week. He's a main event uh, in a very, very tough fight, and he hasn't been able to train. He's been training in, in parks, uh, no sparring, no speed bags, etc. So I, I think that... Um, that the gyms, particularly uh, gyms uh, like Leeson's that are training professional athletes should be allowed to be open to train their professional athletes. Not, not the rest of the people, not the kids and the people that come in just using the gym for, uh, uh, for training or, or for recreation, uh, but my professional fighters should be able to train uh, just like the professional uh, basketball players and the professional baseball players we shouldn't be discriminated against. And uh, so you and the press that are out there, um, please help here. Let's uh, let's get something in the papers or wherever we can. But uh, uh, professional fighters should be allowed to train like like other professional athletes. You know, you you started it, so we might as well get right into it. Do you think? Uh, let me first, Jill. I'm well, missing Don Majeski. Hi, welcome. Nice to be here. I can't wait to get to this discussion about the gyms opening up and the arenas opening up. I really, many of us are here from New York and we've gone through it. Now, it's an outrage. An outrage was happening to Bruce, what's happening to our industry. I really am calling on Ndidi Massey, the chairman of the New York Commission, to do something or resign. She's totally unqualified for the position. Where is she advocating for boxing, the business of boxing? Because boxers go to the gym so they make a living, not so they can lose 15 pounds, not to, so they can look good. For a reception. They're going there specifically to work. It's a job related industry. You're stopping an entire industry from uh, earning income. And that affects everybody. It affects the boxer, affects people like Bruce who own the gym, the trainers, the managers, the booking agents, the matchmakers. Everybody in the industry is affected by this. And we have no game plan. There's nothing laid out by the, by the state but, or, or the commission should say, look, we plan. We may not be able to do this, Bruce, but by August 1st, we'll open the gym. By August 15th, we'll allow so many people. By August 10th, we'll have, by the 1st of September, boxing. We'll allow crowds in by October. Maybe we don't hit these guidelines, but we'll have something laid out. And they've done absolutely nothing. It's an outrage. Well, when it comes to New York, I have always felt so many of these rules are arbitrary. Whether it's, um, you, you know, something like opening the gyms or instant replay or i mean there are just so many rules we seem to be low-hanging fruit 
when it comes. But, but the point that I'm making or they're trying to make is that they're, they're allowing professional athletes to train. If you're a basketball player, you're allowed to train. If you're a baseball player, you're allowed to train. Here in New York, the, uh, again, the Brooklyn Nets are, are an example. They're one mile away uh, from Gleason's gym and they're in a gym and they're allowed to train, but professional fighters are not. And so it's, it's a discrimination. Again, I'm not trying to open a gym for the general public. I'm only trying to open a gym for my professional fighters. And it's very easy to keep track of them because they're all issued a federal ID. So if you're, a, if you're issued a federal ID, that means you're a professional fighter. You should be afforded the same courtesy as a professional basketball player or baseball player. Uh, but Bruce, what however, is nobody, Bruce? nobody wants to listen. Bruce, Bruce hypothetically, they said anything to you? I mean, when you've reached out to the commission, have you talked uh, to the, have you spoken uh, to the actually, commission I, I, or the I director? Wrote, what do they say? I wrote an email uh, to the commission and this morning before this uh, uh, Zoom took place. Uh, Kim called me and uh, said that uh, she would like me to send to her in writing a plan on how to open a gym, and she would forward it up the up the chain. So she did answer me today, uh, but no one else has. I mean, I, I was I had a piece in the uh, in the New York Post last week. Uh, no response from anyone. Um, this week, uh, WPIX is going to come over and do a, do a piece on it. So I, I'm hoping through through the publicity, through the through the media. Uh, somebody in the governor's office will, will pay attention. Uh, Bruce, hypothetically, if the Brooklyn Nets wanted to use Gleason's gym to work out for strength and conditioning, would they be allowed to go to Gleason's to work out? I, I don't think so. I, my gym is not allowed to open. So it's not allowed to open for the, uh, the Nets nor, or, nor anyone else. So I, I'm closed. I'm sitting in an empty gym right now. Um, you and you have to pay, and you and you have and you're incurring an enormous expense in the meantime. Yeah, you know this is an area called Dumbo. Uh, for those of you outside of New York, uh, Dumbo is is a is a section in New York City, and it's ranked the fourth wealthiest neighborhood uh, in in all of the the five boroughs. And the only reason why I'm bringing that up is because the rent is uh, is extremely high here. And yes, I, I have to pay rent. I have to pay all my uh, my utilities, like like you do, like everyone else does. So, um, by opening up for the professional uh, athletes, the professional boxers, really won't significantly significantly help me financially. Um, I'm doing it more for the for the athletes because, you know, I'm probably if if the uh, in New York City we we have 20 25 pro fighters that uh, train in the different gyms. I'm only one of several gyms that they train at, so financially it's it's not going to make a uh, a big difference. But it's the principle of it. Why why are we in, in the boxing community uh, being discriminated against? We're professional fighters. We're professional athletes. Are they looking to keep you closed until like Equinox, those kind of gyms open up or? Yeah, see, that, that's the point oh, that I made on. is that when they when they did this, they closed me down on March 16th and they used this real broad uh, uh, brush and I'm lumped in with yoga classes. I'm young, young, young you know, with, with Crunch or Equinox, any of these places. And I'm saying that I should be the exception. I'm not, I'm trained professional fighters. I'm not a yoga class and uh, uh, I just can't get anybody to to listen. Uh, Ruth, all, in all due respect, it's not just you. It's yeah. every boxing gym in the state. So this should be a class action that affects every gym, every fighter in the state, from from Buffalo to Staten Island. So we really we don't organize. That's the problem. Yeah, but you, a licensee in the state to write a letter to the governor. That's yeah, the problem. A petition. With, with the insurance that closed down all the small promoters, there was a mistake even they found in the language, and it still closed down all the promoters in New York. No, nope. we never do anything. We never do as a group, as a boxing professional. Of everybody, we never stick together and write a lot. You talk about all these demonstrations. They come together one umbrella, whether they all agree or not. At least they're fighting with un one umbrella. We do nothing. And as I said, Bruce, it affects everybody in the state, not just New York City. Where are the other gym owners screaming? We got to write letters, promoters, matchmakers. Everybody has a license. Has it in the state of New York? Has an interest in this outcome? So well, that's, that's that's all. The problem. You know, we're, we're, we're an, in, an industry of individuals. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason why the, the, the uh, uh, basketball players and the baseball players can do it, they have a huge industry. They have lawyers, they have attorneys. You try to say something nasty about a basketball player and you'll get sued. Mm -hmm. But you can say anything you want about anybody in, in, or anything in boxing and nobody, nobody is there to, to defend us. 
So, so we do need unity. So Don has offered a remedy, which is contacting every gym owner. Well, in every, every licensed professional, because the gym has to be licensed. Everybody in the business should send a letter, maybe get together, have a meeting. Bruce, I don't know if we can have a meeting even. At, uh, maybe we can have a demonstration. We'll, they won't let us meet. But, uh, you know, and get us to sign off on a petition. But where is the chairman of the commission, Bruce? Where is this Ndidi Massey? Where is she? What let me tell you, Don, Don, there's a difference between boxing and the other sports. The commission, they're political appointees. The other sports aren't appointed yeah, by we're anyone. We're all paying taxes. We're all paying license fees. We, what stops us all from writing a letter and saying we demand that you do respond to this, to have boxing professionals allowed to apply their trade? And to do so, they need to go to a boxing gym. Let us have the gyms open. Listen to what Jack said. If the political appointees come out against the governor, it's not in their favor. Yes, we have independently. And where are these professional boxers training now, is my question. Nowhere. In the park. Well, I, I think... Have, I have a kid, Mikel Lespierre. He's fighting uh, on the 18th in Las Vegas. It's an uh, ESPN show with no audience. He's the main event. And he's fighting uh, Jose Pedroza, who is a real, real tough fighter. And I'm not sure where Pedroza, uh, whether his state has allowed him to train or not. But my kid is training in a park up in the Bronx uh, with his trainer, uh, who's an ex-champion, Jose Guzman, uh, or Joanne Guzman. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it's certainly, uh, you know, not a fair fight. This, this kid, Pedroz, is a real tough fighter, and it's going to be a tough fight no matter what. But my <laughs> kid is training in a park. No sparring, no heavy bags, no speed bags. So it's, it's Chris, a I think you hit the nail on the head. If you make it a safe, if we make it a safety issue, and it winds up in the governor's office, then they might open up the gyms because it's not really going to be enough time to train. And the longer the gyms are closed, the longer it's going to take to get into fighting shape. So what you're going to have a lot of cases of as soon as the gyms open, fighters are going to be boxing sooner than they actually should on shows. And uh, that's where the danger lies. Well, but who, who, who is the governor's office care to even listen to it i i you know it, you guys uh are, are listening and, and agreeing i'm sure if we get somebody from the governor's office they, they might or might not agree but i can't even get anybody to listen to me terrible what about your local state senator the local state assembly person have you tried to reach them to go and and uh, we're not demanding as you said they get their appointees but maybe the governor's not even cognizant of this we're such a small industry i always have the saying in boxing you're guilty until proven guilty <laughs> such disregard for us. I mean, which I've gone through this all my life. We are garbage to everybody because we're such a small group. I had a complaint once. I said, well, get your group together and protest. Come up to Albany and pick it. They said, how many licensees in the state? Is it 200? There's 400,000 teachers. So when they say something, they listen. With us, they don't. But maybe through a, a state senate, a state assembly person, because it's, it's it, again, you're a lone wolf going out there, but it affects everyone in the industry and we've got to mobilize behind it. It's terrible. You're going to have kids going out there getting knocked out because they can't train and this affects the entire state. And no, this, how much do you bring in? It's not just how small the group is. This is an income producing mm -hmm. business for the state, you know, but it, it's, it's very difficult. So Bruce, who would be your allies in this? I mean, have you spoken to Peter King? Does that matter at all? He's on the wrong political party, but he's very pro-boxing. No, and, and he's been in Gleason's gym, so certainly I, I could reach out to him. I haven't reached out to any politicians. I've really done it uh, more through emails uh, to, uh, to Albany and through certain, several of the, uh, uh, the media people. Um, so I certainly can try Peter King, and I can try my local uh, representative as, as well. I would try Peter King, and I would take it from the point that Don said, which is it's, it's become a health issue. It's a health and safety issue. They're being unprepared. Yeah, and you know, if, if the governor who is worrying about the whole state and, and the, our, our epidemic in, in the state, uh, you know, we're not talking about that many people. You know, I, I don't know how many uh, licensed boxers or, or, uh, or fellows that have a, a federal ID are, are located here in, in, uh, in Manhattan or in, uh, in the five boroughs, but it's not an exorbitant amount of people. So... Have you spoken to Marty Hill or any of the people who've opened gyms through Atlanta and places like that? Have, had, have they had any issues at all? I mean, how are they functioning there? Yeah, no, I, I have not reached out to them. So that's a, that's a great suggestion. I can find out what to, 
you know, what they're doing. Jack, you're mm -hmm. probably going to have the boxing right. Why don't you help organize a little group of us together? I, mean, I think the best thing to do actually is get the fighters themselves to have some signs, march outside of Gleason's, get a news crew, get it on the news. And that that's the best way to get attention. But what about it's, getting a go an audience with the governor, the lieutenant governor, or somebody directly there who's going to make this? But, Where is the chairman of the commission? Where is this woman? What is she doing now? She's the chairman of the new. What's she doing right now? She's not doing anything in boxing. She's not on this podcast. I've never seen a quote in a newspaper or on a television show on a radio discussing. Where is this person? The point that is the head of boxing in New York State. Where is she? Where the hell is she? She wasn't. No argument there. Yeah. I know that. So where the hell is she? Jack, is she with you, Jack? <laughs> no, no, I. I mean. With the commission, it seems like late. I just want to be quiet. And well, why don't we reach out to them? They should now. be taking the initiative at this point. Oh, yeah. And because uh, I know uh, gym owners like Bruce are going to be short. There's going to be safe distancing, and things are going to be done the right way with the gyms opened up with the pandemic and so on. And in this way, the fighters who have a fight coming up would be given a certain priority and at least they could be in fighting shape. Uh, you're putting them under more risk because some of them are going to enter the ring and they're not going to be in any type of shape. They would have hardly sp sparred before fighting and some are just going to, you know, just sign to mm -hmm. fight and like Bruce said, you know, they'll be working out in the park or shadow boxing at home and that doesn't do it. No, no, it doesn't do it. And even in the controlled, some people have come out asymptomatic with COVID. So there's really no difference between allowing them to be in a controlled situation in the gym, that, those few people, or being in a camp secluded because it's the same risk factor involved there. They get tested, they, go to, they have to go. I got to tell you, with Don knowing the business, it's phenomenal. Uh, Don's a close friend and he sent me a photo a few weeks ago in Zaire. He was sitting there like in the first row behind Jim Brown and you see Don with the typewriter for the Ali Corman fight working. So Don, I mean, you talk about a guy who goes back legendary and he's a very close friend of the WBC. He's like family with the WBC. The problem is I talk a lot, but I don't do a lot. You know, you got to do things. You <laughs> have these ideas now, who's going to enforce yeah. them? You know, Jack, you're much better organized than Jill and, and Bruce, you get things done. but. We've got, this is really an outrage. It's, it's, it's crazy uh, that the whole industry is shut down and the fighters again, as you say, this is not just a health club or a yoga or fitness. These are people's lives depend on when they can't pay their rent and they can't put food on the table. On well, everything. it affects not just the fighters, it affects people like Don, Bruce, you know, and I'm not sure to what extent Larry, but uh, people who make a living or have an income, you know, from boxing of being deprived that. But what, what we can't forget the fact that they are letting professional athletes train. They are letting basketball players train. They are letting baseball players train. Why aren't they letting professional boxers train? Those baseball players and basketball players, are they being housed together? Uh, I, I don't know what their what their rules and regulations are. I, I only know what, you know, I listen to Cuomo every day in his, his briefing. And uh, three weeks ago, he allowed the professional athletes to start training in New York. Or, uh, and uh, they excluded boxing. Because well, I, I got to tell you, Bruce, when, something when I, around. You know, when I, when I call and make inquiries, uh, they send me a form letter back saying, well, you're in this category. Look up and it'll tell you when you can restart. I, know, I don't know when I can restart. Nobody's ever said when the gyms can restart but I know what category I fall in. I'm just saying that we should be an exception to gyms. Why should I be as, uh, in the same category as a yoga studio? It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. What, to what agency are you dealing with? Is this the health department or, or who? The police? No, uh, just uh, the, you go online and uh, they give you uh, emails to send to the governor's office for exceptions and nobody answers. Or, no, have you done I sent so many emails about positive things. I've yet to get an answer back from anyone, okay. anyone. But I, I, I did get a piece in the, in the New York uh, Post last week. And Thank on you. Wednesday at 1030, uh, WPIX Channel 11 is going to come in and interview me on the, uh, on the subject. So I'm going to uh, take uh, Jack's suggestion and try to get a couple fighters here and, uh, and let them uh, uh, say the same thing in their own words. 
Means I'm going to tell you what's ironic because Bruce mentioned the Brooklyn Nets a couple of times. Kyrie Irving is the head of the players' union there. And the big talk this morning was whether the NBA players want to come back and even resume the season because there's some talk it might take away from the protests and so on. So it's very ironic the mentality of athletes that the NBA players might actually consider not going back this year while the boxers want to go back in the worst way. Of course, is it, one is some of them are on contract. The boxers are basically freelance. They're not a member of a league. They, a lot of them are going to starve if they don't go back. Well, so, most of the players have contracts with promoters. You know, promoters. So, is this another reason that maybe people think we should have a federal commission? Somebody. No, no, how about no commission? They want to abolish. <laughs> let's abolish the New York State Athletic Commission because what does it do? Commission job. It does nothing. Taxation without representation is tyranny, and that's what we have. We should have a guy like Bruce like Silverglade to be the head of the commission. No, 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 I, no it's, it's hard enough just running a gym. I don't want to run uh, the commission. Oh, I can't wait till Ted gets on screen now. <laughs> but uh, I, I do want to say, uh, Don, um, I got a call this morning from Kim uh, Sumler. Uh, I believe she's the executive director uh, of the New York State Athletic Commission. Uh, so this, this morning was the first uh, time she responded, and she did uh, ask me to send her something in writing, and she'll uh, go forward. Right. Well, maybe you should start a petition online. I'll say, but we'll all sign it. You know, let's all sign it. And she gets 200 names on there. That's got a little bit of force behind it. You know, Lou DeBellas and, and people who are, you know, uh, Joe DeGuardia and yourself and, you know, boxers who live in the state. I think that's going to show a little something, you know, a little weight. And we'll, we'll just put it online. We'll all sign off on it. And she'll have his 200 signatures of everybody, of every aspect of judges, referees, sports writers. Everybody can sign on to it, you know, and say, well, here's who's advocating for this. It's not just one or two people here. It's not just Bruce Silverglade, you know, uh, trying to make a living for himself. He's trying to do something for boxing, make a living for the industry, which is dead. All right. I wonder what states have opened their gyms. I know we're opening in Thailand now under very, very strict protocols. Nevada uh, is open, definitely. They've got a gym because they know fighters who are training out there. Uh, I guess. Nevada and, and, Georgia, and Georgia. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So. I don't know what other states have allowed it, but well, we again, can find that out. Yeah. In between a gym and a professional boxing gym, mm -hmm. I mean, as Bruce says, there has to be a high distinction between people who are. It's Let like me, it's like karaoke versus Barbara Streisand. I mean, he's not talking about opening a karaoke bar. He's talking about a Broadway show, and mm -hmm. you got to let people work. Well, don't use that analogy because they're closed as well. So I just think it's an oversight. I think it's just a blanket policy. All gyms are closed, and they didn't look further into it. You know, you know, so That's exactly that. That was the point I was trying to make. They they made a blanket statement. They used this big broad uh, uh, brush, uh, and they don't have any mechanism for exceptions. And there's got to be uh, somebody that can say, well, listen, there's an exception to this particular rule. Um, and you know, uh, when when all gyms and, and all athletes were, were shut down, uh, then I just felt fine I'm part of it. Uh, but when he said that professional athletes can start training, well, then we, I have professional athletes. And, and now I can see where I'm the exception uh, to uh, to gyms. So, but nobody wants to listen. Well, Don, he gave you a suggestion. And now we're going to move on. Jack, what's your pet peeve? Okay. My pet peeve, I mean, you that's one of the things you went up. One of my pet peeves, I wrote a column on this recently. There's standards in boxing that don't exist in the other sports. I mean, we tend to accept them. Uh, the things that are said at press conferences, for example, imagine a coach would say certain of the things. Uh, that coach would be suspended or maybe banned for life. I mean, and it, uh, they'll use certain words you know, shouldn't be used and, uh, you know, there'll be steroid use, but the fighters who've used the steroids eventually get into the Hall of Fame, you know, with no questions asked or voted upon by the Boxing Writers Association of America. And if it happens in another sport to athletes like uh, Barry Bonds, you know, Roger Clemens, et cetera, they don't get voted into the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. It's just like a double standard, you know, with boxing. Uh, you know, it seems like we expect less. Well, you think we expect less of our people and 
and that sort of coincides with what Bruce was saying, that we're thought of less. Do you think that well, the two of those are connected? Well, code of behavior, there was a train, I don't have to mention his name, who called Keith Thurman the N-word a couple of times at a press conference, he went off, and he wasn't suspended by the commission. They just basically told him, don't talk like that anymore. He would now imagine if a coach at a press conference before a playoff game in the Super Bowl started going off and calling players, you know, the N word. I mean, it's fired forever. Excuse right. me. He'd be fired forever. He'd be. He'd be fired forever, <laughs> right, Larry? Exactly. But how come, Larry, we tolerate this in boxing uh, and just say, you know, it's one of those things he shouldn't say it. We look down on the person and. Fighters act a certain way, and it's just. Uh, Don't you think that's going to start changing now? I know the WBC has a code of ethics, and anybody is yeah. saying. I, it. I don't think it's going to change. Well, years ago, until, until we uh, we uh, have some representation of some sort. You know, again, you know, uh, Don mentioned it. Everybody in boxing is alone. Everybody is their own person. Okay, the writers are individuals. Every fighter is an individual. The promoters are individual. We, we really have no, you know, no nobody as, as a mouthpiece. And we don't speak as a union. We don't speak together. Everybody is, is individual. So it, it, until we get some sort of a league, uh, like the basketball players, like the football players, like the baseball players, you know, we're just individuals. And so uh, if this uh, this coach that you're talking about, he's reprimanded in, in Nevada, so what? He goes to Jersey, he'll fight in Jersey. He'll, you know, he'll go to New York, he'll fight in New York. There have been some attempts of unifying, like the Promoters League and things like that. Everyone has such vast different interests that it doesn't seem to really coalize. Oh, you know what? We really don't have one interest. We want to make a living. Promoters want to make a living. Trainers, boxers, you're on different sides. So we have like an organization of boxing professionals because what everybody in boxing needs is professional boxing to survive. Without boxing, nobody makes a living. So we could do an ad hoc group, you know, uh just so fight for our own interest as we say here's an irony everyone who works in boxing has to be licensed by the government state government federal id yet the government does nothing for us ironically basketball baseball where they're training have no government the government has no control over them they don't control whether they can play or can't play that's within the league itself but we they can stop us from earning a living the government does yet the government does nothing for us nothing at all and as to your statement, Jack, I'm a true amoralist. I mean, in boxing, I work with the Boxing Hall of Fame. And one thing we did is there's no more moral code. There's no saying if you were a murderer, a bank robber, this is, you're just judged by what you do in the profession. And I'm very much for free speech. I'm not going to uh, say we should ban James Joyce and Ulysses like they did 100 years ago because he used profanity. I think that's a way of expressing things. I'd rather use profanity than have somebody come over and hit me on the head or stab me with a knife or shoot me or throw a brick through my window. You know? Well, listen, speaking of the WBC, Jose Suleiman, I believe, had his leg broken because of an altercation between Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis. A physical a altercation. Now, a could you physical, imagine, not a verbal altercation. altercation. But can you imagine Roger Goodell with the NFL, a press conference before the Super Bowl, a couple of the players are going at it and he's in the middle and he gets injured. You think they'd be allowed to play the game? If a, a physical altercation, no, and Jose let them play. Yes, we have lower standards, but very libertarian in certain ways. Well, I'm not putting yeah. Jose down for that. I'm just saying he was a victim in that case. He was a victim of a physical altercation. That was a yeah. but we let it go on. As I said, he didn't stop Lennox Lewis and Tyson from fighting, you know? It, we are much more forgiving and accepting. Look, you talk about integration. We were the first organization to have uh, people of outside, uh, you know, blacks and whites and, uh, and mongoloid people from Asia uh, box. There was no criteria. You know, we let anything and anyone happen. We didn't draw a line. We're always an outlaw kind of an organization. We're sort of put in the same position as gambling and prostitution. We're a vice more than a than a profession to a lot of people. But that's the, as they say in the golfer, that's the line. That, that's the, the profession we've chosen. You know? That's what Jimmy Breslin called the red light district of sports. Yeah. But there are still certain lines that we can make. Like I know the BC, and I, I'm saying BC because I happen to know what they do. There is a code of ethics. If somebody says something that's racial or derogatory, they get called out on it. They may get suspended. They may get fined. 
-hmm. but they definitely have to issue apology and an explanation for what they've done. Mm -hmm. the but the Von Haney, what just happened recently. Right. Well, I wish the commission would uh, issue a letter of explanation as what they've done as to why they can't let us apply our profession in this state. Well, we have a member of the commission on this panel. Where are they? Can we ever find them? What are they doing now? Are they getting full salaries? Are they running off to, you know, the you Caribbean or what the hell are they doing? Come on a panel like this because mm -hmm. it's the only one who has risked it has been Nitan Sethi, who is the medical head of medical because they are very limited in what they are allowed to say and then allowed to show any kind of affiliation with a, a governing or a sanctioning body. But, they don't have, but what about boxing? Can they have an affiliation with the, with the industry that they oversee that they can tell you you can't make a living? Are, they allow, are we allowed to ask why we can't? Do they answer to anybody? I mean, is this an autocratic society that uh, they can do what they want and the hell with you? How can they take revenue when they're not even responsible to the people whose, uh, whose uh, businesses they're, they're there to oversee? Well, right. which of the commissions we've had in New York do you wish were here now? And Didi Massey, the chairman of the New York State Athletic Committee. Where the hell is she? Who the hell is she? Even better. What's a credential to get that job? Where? I want to hear. Where is she? I'm a New Yorker. I pay taxes. I make a living out of boxing. Not much in New York State. Bruce has a business that's invested hundreds of thousands in. She has, he has the right to hear from her politics. Where Larry, the hell is this woman? Larry, do you have her? Larry, is she with you? Yeah, she's not. Okay, but let's go and think about the commissions. Which commission do you think was the best that we've had in the last, say, 20 years? I, I, I like, <laughs> are you waving me off? No, I was saying not everyone at once. No one wanted to speak. Oh, no, I, I, I'll tell you, I liked Ron Stevens. And the reason why I liked Ron Stevens is when he was in the commission, he had meetings. He had meetings for trainers. He had meetings for uh, promoters. He had meetings for cut men. He had meetings for fighters. He would go over the rules. Uh, sometimes Ron uh, could drive you a little bit crazy, but at least he was in there and he, he gave rules. He gave regulations it, before every fight. If you went to the weigh-in, he, was, he would talk and talk, but he would go over the rules. He would ask the fighters, do you know what this rule means? Do you know what that rule means? And there, there was a communication between the fighters and the commission and the gyms. Uh, I used to get uh, a sheet uh, monthly saying who's, who's um, on, uh, on suspension. If they're on suspension, they're not allowed to train in your gym. Uh, I haven't gotten one of those in years. That's uh, I still pay my fee every year to the commission and I get my little certificate that says I'm licensed. And uh, if the commission doesn't come over and, and uh, investigate me, uh, that's fine with me. Um, but there used to be a, a, an interplay between the commission and the gyms and the commission and the fighters uh, and, uh, and the shows. Uh, and I don't know that that's in existence today. So Ron, Ron was the last one that uh, was very, very uh, interactive with everyone. I'm going to agree with you. I thought he was uh, sort of a younger man going on to being a curmudgeon, but he gave you confidence when he took the helm. He knew the sport. You didn't necessarily have to agree with him, but he interacted with everyone in a very knowledgeable way. I, I liked him too. Yeah, because he, you know, he, he came from boxing. He was a matchmaker. Uh, he was a promoter. Uh, so he knew boxers, he knew boxing, he knew what, what it took to put on a show, how to promote a show. He knew the safety rules. He knew what fighters had to do or, and not do. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if the people that are in the commission today, uh, you know, came from boxing. You know, they're, they're running the boxing commission and, and none of them have, have ever done anything with boxing. Can you imagine that they had Ray Kelly was the commissioner at one point while he was the police commissioner. Imagine that being the police commissioner and the boxing commissioner at the same time. That's, that like Trump, that's like when Donald Trump, after he got elected, he wanted to do The Apprentice. That's how. That, but that shows what they think of us. We need a policeman to oversee. You don't ever see a policeman as the chairman, as the, as the, as the president of the NFL, Major League Bay, the NHL. It'd be insane. But we need to po be police. This is their perception of us, that we are criminals that we need the police department. Look, I would add that Mal Sutter was a very good commissioner. Randy Gordon was an excellent commissioner. I think Malvina Lathan did a good job. Randy Gordon put through an action, to me, is the greatest single action by any boxing commission in the history of this country. He said that the New York State Commission will pay for the medical. 
Every commission should pay for the medicals. That's what we call an unfunded mandate. We want you to do this and do that. And I always say, we'll do anything. We'll have the fights in a hospital uh, if you want them. But if you want these medicals, then you should pay for them. Otherwise, why are we doing it? If the people say we don't want to pay for them, that's their option. It's a non-transferable disease. Somebody wants to fight and they're injured. That's their choice. I don't say they should, but if you want it, Randy Gordon found a way to get the state to pay for it. When that was rescinded, we didn't fight against that group. That's gone. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue that killed every small club in the state and cost promoters vast amounts of money. They said, we just won't promote New York. We'll move it outside. That's why we're losing boxing. But why doesn't the state do it? Why don't we do anything about that? Nobody complained. Nobody's complaining here about the gyms being closed, that the, the arenas are closed, that we can't have business. We just and then, we're so apathetic that we just let them run all over us. Well, it seems really interesting that none of the people who run boxing come from boxing. Mm -hmm. None of them. The closest even would, would be Kim, who comes from MMA, mm -hmm. out, you know, from O'Hagan, I think, or something. But none of the people who've been given the big jobs in boxing have ever really been in boxing. I mean, it's like, not only do they put us down, they don't trust any of us. That's correct. With Crim Matt Delaglio, I think, does a great job with the commission. He should be the chairman of the committee. Who? At least Matt Delaglio. Matt is a great guy. He Matt should be. Why is the chairman appointed by, why isn't the chairman of the commission elected by the licensees of the state? What is wrong with that? She's overseeing us. We're all not going to agree on the vote for, but at least we have a consensus that we all vote. We at least will have voted for somebody who knows what the hell they're doing. So some of us have at least a plurality. We have confidence. Says, Here's your chairman, a do-nothing chairman. It's amazing. In one of the most lethal sports that, that there is, that we have the least experienced people on most commissions. And if you move out of New York, it doesn't get better. I mean, there are certain states that are very good. But if you go into certain states, it's like I've been as a supervisor where the doctor doesn't show up at the weigh-in. Or where I mean it's it's or where somebody gets cut and the doctor at the ringside says, "Oh, you should go to the hospital. You need someone to stitch you up." It's like, no, that's what you're supposed to do. I mean, it's it's really quite amazing. And we, the New York Commission is a better commission. Yeah. We may not like certain things, but they are a legitimate commission. Move to some states where a fighter has been suspended. Um, Daniel was an example of that. California said no, another state said no, so he fought in Iowa and then ended up with a brain bleed because they accepted him there. I mean, the rules are arbitrary. What I think happens periodically, very tragically, a fighter gets seriously injured and then it's all over the news and then the governor's office steps in and then they shake the commission up. They don't care about the body of work or the circumstances. They just care about all the negative PR that they're getting. Yes, no, I, I, absolutely. But we had, what, four deaths last year? This is no time to get easy on, on who's running what. We need professional people who know boxing, who know the risks of boxing, running these commissions and making the rules for boxing. If they, were, if they were elected by the licensees, that's what we have, because they're not going to vote for anybody who doesn't know. They'd have to sell it. They have to convince us, the licensees, that they deserve to have the job. So they had to have a credential. You couldn't come in from left field, uh, be a do nothing, know nothing. That would eliminate, but they want to be too autocratic. It's, it's, it's a complete totalitarian kind of state there. Well, it's a, it's a government appointing. Change the rules. La the laws are written by that's human that's beings. You can change yeah. laws. In, in, in boxing, we, we don't have one set of rules. You know, the, the ring can be a different size in any venue, okay? The, the matting can be different. It can be hard in one ring and, and soft in another ring. Uh, we don't have any any rules. Right, but we could, Bruce, right? I mean, if we, we ABC could. exists in theory that this is a group of American commissions. Theoretically, said we're going to have all standardized medicals. We're going to have, oh, the legislature. Well, then fight for it, but they won't. They won't. Nobody pushes hard enough. You think somebody in Kansas is going to fight to change the law? Well, most of these laws are written 100 years ago, then they're amended. But it's basically laws that exist over 100 years ago. That's why there's no room for promotional rights. If I'm a manager and I, I'm entitled to 33 and a third percent, and I go to you and you're promoting a show, Bruce, or Jack or Jill, I, I say, all right, it's 10000 on the counter. Give me 5000 under the table for me. Okay, it's 15000 I go to jail. But if a promoter says, give 10000 give me 50000 for my promotional rights, it's perfectly okay. There should be a limit. If a promoter transfers rights to another promoter, it should be capped at 30% or 25%.
So not just arbitrary figure, I can pick any number. I get 100,000 from a promoter and I'm the alleged co-promoter and I pay the fight at 20, I make 80. But this is what goes on. There's, that because there are no rules for promotional rights written in most of these laws because the laws were 110 years old where that concept didn't exist. So there's some standardize the medicals. How hard can that be? Every state of national license, that can't be too hard. You know, it's just say, well, we'll have the standardization of the medicals, whatever it is. Everybody wants an MRI. We all got to get an MRI. And we could take 1% of every revenue of, of, of the money from every show in the country and put it directly towards medicals or raise the fees on the licenses and put half of that money directly in a central uh, bank or a central uh, uh, holding situation for all the medical bills. It could, they just, there's no force of will. It's just the problem. It's, it's, but I, I need to, Larry to say something, Don. I'm, you're so, so passionate on this subject, yeah. And by the way, another great commissioner that people are going to throw things at. I love Greg Serve. I like working with Greg Serve. He's gives me confidence. He knows his stuff. Mm -hmm. Larry, say something. Larry, say something. Listen to the experts. What can I say? Mm. <laughs> What's that picture behind you? It's the uh... nice. <laughs> I like it. Larry's rope doping you, Don. He's listening to you, and then he's going to come back with something logical. Hey, Larry, I came into this later with, with Boxing Insider. Why? And the one thing I did want to ask you about is Larry was very, very close to Francisco Mendez. So what's going on there with that, Jim, now? Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was close with Francisco, but I was more, I was more close with Nelson Cuevas. Uh, so it was, it was fr from being, from going to both the gyms, it was, it was, it, it was hard, but no one, no one really knows they're planning on opening, <laughs> but if they're going to be closed for months on months, I mean, it all depends. At some point, it depends on their landlord. Right. So, I mean, I can tell you that a lot of the coaches I've spoken with are, are very nervous. They don't know what they're going to do. I don't want to say any names, but a coach I'm friends with at Gleason, he says, well, I don't know when I'm going to come back. It just seems to be that my, my way of being able to make a living for the next few months is, is, is over. So, I mean, it's, it's up in the air for everybody, whether it's Mendez or Gleason's or South Box or any of the gyms, really. Mm -hmm. Do you feel the online classes do anything to waylay some of the trainers' problems? I mean, it's, it's money in their pockets, but it's, it's, it's pennies compared to what they're making. Yeah. And, and uh, the online, uh, the, people don't want to pay the same amount uh, of money to their trainer for an online lesson as they did uh, as for an in-person lesson. So some of the trainers, uh, uh, or many of my trainers over here, are, are doing online uh, some of them are meeting at, at, in the parks and stuff like that. But, um, you know, the, the revenue is not what it was uh, for, you know, a good solid lesson in, in a Mendez gym or a Gleason's gym. Right. So now that boxing is coming back in a different form, no fans, whatever, um, what do you think about this remote judging that they're using now? Remember, these are all stopgap measures because we can't do it the way it's like this or nothing in some cases. But what do you think about remote judging? I think it's it's very difficult uh, because every even even with uh, judging when you're sitting around the uh, the ring, uh, the angle that you're looking at is different on all four sides of the ring. Uh, so again, with, with remote uh, uh, judging, it's going to depend on what cameras they're looking at or whether they have multiple cameras or whatever. But I think it's uh, it's very uh, difficult. Anyone else? I mean, I'll tell you, most of us, the majority of fights we all watch, we watch on TV because boxing takes place all over the world. And we score fights off TV and we're kind of used to it. Of course, it's a camera angle, but it's the same at ringside. I remember going to a club show and I was sitting next to one of the judges who wasn't working that fight. And we all scored four, four, four rounds to nothing for one fighter. But the three other judges scored four rounds to nothing for the other fighter because we want another side of the ring. And it's all the, the angle that you're watching it mm -hmm. at, really. And like Bruce is saying, the camera angle. And it's, yeah, it's really so hard to tell at times. But the one who actually has the best view is the referee because the referee can move all over. And the referee used to score the fights in, in England, in fact. The ref used to be the only one to, you know, score the fights because they could see every possible angle. Right. So there's, there's really no perfect way. But yeah, when would it apply that we'd have to have virtual judges? Because there's boxing in Nevada now and the commission has judges work there. You know, they live judges who sit there. I think you need the 3D concept. You need 
Boxing is not two dimensional, like on a screen. You don't hear, see the power of the punches. You don't see the angle of the punches. Being there is totally different than watching it on a screen on a television. But Jill, when would this apply? Because any place that would have boxing, they would allow judges. If they're allowing the fighters to have that kind of contact, they wouldn't allow judges to sit at ringside and watch the fights. So Why would we need virtual? In Mexico, they're they're having remote, but they're having like five judges. Um, and what they're doing is as they even have the judges there, they're also using remote judges just to see if their scores um, are similar to the ones. They're just trying everything they can to keep boxing going during a time when it's so very difficult. So, I mean, of course, the person that, that we have to keep in mind, the most important one is the athlete who's going to get that, you know, win or loss based on the judges. But they're doing their best. I think that it's an honest and, and a forthright way of trying to keep boxing going at a time when it, it, it is really so difficult, so difficult. So I have another question. With all the platforms we have now, do you think that's improved boxing? Do you think it's taken away from the excitement of boxing? What do you think? Do you think it's put more stress on the boxers themselves? Which, how do you mean platforms? Well, we have technologically in, in, in online platforms in addition to network platforms. We've never had so much boxing. Before this happened, we've never had so much boxing. Boxing was like soaring. 100%, yeah, I think that the platforms have improved it, right? More exposure, more improvement. Yeah, yeah the, the excitement of the bout is up to that individual fight uh, and, and the two fighters that, uh, that are involved. Um, more people can watch it on, on different uh, platforms and different venues. The thing is, we have to but whether it's exciting or not is up to the fighters themselves. Hey. You know, you know, it's interesting with all the talk with the national anthem, you know, with all the sports and boxing is the one sport during the national anthem, the fight is going to be shadow boxing, moving around and no one cares. I kind of wonder whether that's going to be an issue down the line. Hmm. Could be. And what about open scoring? What do you guys think of open scoring? I'm 100% for open scoring. I, I always bring up the point that it's the only sport where the athlete doesn't have the right to know if he's winning or losing a bout. I can't see the argument against it. Why should I have a fight? I will give you an argument against it, Don, because it's going to influence the judges adversely. Because they're going to open scoring. The crowd's going to know the scores. They're going to boo. There's going to be a certain pressure on the judge to swing another round another way. The best thing is just to keep the card private. Normally the fighter has a good idea going into the later rounds what he should do. I, I, not I, hear, I, I hate the argument when the fighter says, oh, I thought I was so far ahead, right. I let up at the end. It, he knows he wasn't that far yeah, ahead. If the judges aren't good enough to withstand the pressure, they shouldn't be judging. You got to be a judge who was a lot of sometimes it becomes hostile. I went to a club show many years ago at the Amazura Club, okay, in Jamaica, Queens. Mm -hmm. The crowd seemed so hostile. I stayed till the very end because I was reporting on the fight, but before this decision was announced, I ducked out, I went to my car, and I drove home. And I figured I'd get the result, you know, You're right. You're a professional but, judge judging a fight. It's like a policeman there. It's going to be a hostile crowd. You got to deal with the crowd. That's part of your job. And if you're not professionally, psychologically well enough to equip to handle it, then don't do that job. But I, I'm talking from the, from the industry. How can you tell me I don't have the right to know my athlete is winning or losing? He's the only one affected by the outcome. Not newspaper men, not anybody else. Their lives are affected by the outcome, the win and loss, as Bruce said. It's the fight of winning and losing. That affects him, as Jill pointed out. But well, don't, they've, they've tried open scoring, Don. We've what? tried it recently, and people haven't liked it. I don't it's not care like we haven't like experimented like with it, because we have. Industry. The bell is rang. Take five. Take, it, take five. I have one quick question. Don't we already have open scoring when you have someone on t TV giving us the number of punches and the number of score already going right across the screen? But yeah. at least it would be an accurate form of open scoring. Well, that's just a guide. I mean, I'm a fan of the punch comp, comp your box, but I don't believe it. I use it as a guide. After I score a round for one fighter, I question myself whether I should have given him the round, and then I see what comp your box did, and that will either confirm it to me or not. But it's not really an accurate measure. Like Don said before, it doesn't show the power to punch, the effectiveness. It's a, it, But it's a fun tool. You know, it's entertaining. So... Who do you think 
is the most underrated fighter out there today? Oh, Jill, you're stumping. I didn't give that any thought. Most underrated fighter. Well, you know, I think Tiafimo Lopez is going to stop Lomachenko. Whoa. So if you want to, I think he'll knock him out. Yeah, so underrated in that sense. But I don't think he could beat Devin Haney. So what could I tell you? John? I have to think of all the fighters I'm involved with so I can name each one of them why they don't get their just due. Uh, I don't know. I have to think about that. You know, Maybe a... Gary Russell if he fight more. The other fights, we don't know how good or bad he is yet. Once a year, he fights. I don't want to get anyone in trouble, Larry. Uh, I mean, it's, there's so many, but I would, if you're saying underrated, it would probably be like you know 50 prospects that no one's ever heard of. I mean, the the uh, the guys on TV, we all know who they are at this point. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to sing. It's kind of hard to single somebody out. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I'll flip it. Who do you think's the most overrated fighter today? Oh, nobody's talking. <laughs> you know, we don't want to get people mad. That's right. I, you know, you can't say that anyone's actually overrated. I mean, it's... Uh... Okay, I'll make it easy. What is the best fight that never happened? All time? Who would you like... Yeah, who would you have liked to have seen that never happened? Carlos Ortiz against Roberto Duran. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, they were scheduled to fight yeah, when Ortiz right. just passed his prime. No, no, I'm at, in their prime. Both of them in their prime, I think, would have been a heck of a fight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would have loved Roy Jones and Bob Foster, mm -hmm. you know, at their best. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry Holmes and George Foreman. It could have happened. You know, there are fights you're thinking yeah. about. Joe Lewis and Jack Dempsey are, but that's really theoretical. The fights that could have happened just didn't take place. Well, the fight that most fans would say if they were polled would say Monzon and Hagler. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Larry? I was going to say uh, Mike Tyson and Riddick Bell. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. hmm. And I, I, of course, will say Lucia Rica and Christy Martin. Yo. Oh, we were thinking like men. I'm sorry yeah, about I that. Know. Yeah. Okay. They well, think about women all the time, now, Jack, so I don't think why would we exclude. Will Layla Ali be given a sanction, Jill, by to fight Cl Clarissa Shields? Clarissa Shields, I think she holds a WBC title, right? If, would Layla Ali without a tune-up fight be given a sanction? I don't know. I, I really can't answer that because... I put you on the spot. No, <laughs> she's up age, so it would have to, it, it would have to depend. How about Lay Ali and Mike Tyson? Layla. <laughs> Mike Tyson? Yeah, well, that you know, she's got the age on him. You know, he may have a few pounds. Now, guys, the yes thing, not boxing. Don, Don is pretty liberal with stuff like if someone wants to do something, they should be allowed. Should Mike Tyson at age 53, if someone's willing to sign him for a big fight, it doesn't have to be a title match right now. Let's say Deontay Wilder is going to step aside out of the Fury rematch and they'll sign Tyson to fight Wilder now. Would you sanction it if you were commissioner? Well, first he'd have to pass- Larry's shaking his head no. Uh, Bruce is taking the conservative view here. And then then you'd have to- and Jack doesn't know what the answer is. So, I mean, if Mike wants to fight like uh, Evander Holyfield or someone his age in like an exhibition fight, but I mean, we don't want to, I don't want to see him, you know, get hurt. I mean, Deontay Wilder could hurt him. So but don't, don't you have the little a minuscule doubt in your mind that Tyson might no. nail him? Very slight. No. no. Did, everyone's wrong. talking about a video that Mike Tyson did hitting the mitts where it was edited and he's it's 15 seconds and he's wearing two different t-shirts wearing it. He probably was hit in the mitts for 20 minutes for that 15 seconds video. So I, I think it's all hype. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to see him come back, but I don't think that's realistic. Yeah, you just said it. You'd love to see him come back. So. Against other fifty, but not against right. Deontay Wilder. I mean, maybe you know Peter McNeely wanted to fight him. That I can see that fight. Okay, I'm going to change the subject again. Women's boxing, two or three minute rounds. Three minutes. You can give. You go through nine months of pregnancy and give birth sometimes ten times in a lifetime. You can go three minute rounds. There's no evidence that a woman's endurance in the ring is any less than a man's, so it should be three minutes. It should be the same unless you show some medical evidence to the contrary, which we haven't seen. Evidence, but it doesn't have to do with endurance. It has to do with concuss. 
Yeah, that, that's what, what I was going to say. A woman doesn't run a 3,000 foot mile. Huh? You, when you have the mile race, and it's 3,500 feet for women, but 5,200 feet for men, you know, she runs the same mile. She runs the same marathon. She competes on every single level, uh, you know, the sports. So why shouldn't she be, uh, what, well, what's the, the concussion rate? Is higher in women than it is in men, Jill? Is it? The concussion rate, according to the evidence that we have from UCLA and from pink concussion, is that women concuss easier and they take longer to heal. If that okay. evidence changes, Mm -hmm. then I will go with you. But the question of could, of course, they could. the question of should. Should men fight 15 pounds? I mean, you know, things are not based only could. You the know, that kind of makes you think you're saying 15 rounds. Like uh, the Jack Johnson, Jim Jeffries fight was scheduled for 45 rounds. <laughs> was that a legitimate 45 rounds in which they'd actually be fighting hard during that time because that's well, 45 hard minute rounds. Yeah, that's hard to comprehend, especially in the heat, you know, on a July 4th. So you're asking for 45 rounds to be returned to men's No, body. no, 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 I can't. You know, we're talking rounds. The WBC was the pioneer to cut it from 15 to 12. Right. But I'm just saying, when we talk about the old time as to schedule a big fight for 45 rounds, how hard could they have been fighting over 45 rounds? It was a different kind of body. You'd see, you watch those old fights, you see a lot of clinching. I mean, it was an endurance test. That's why I say the size of fighters over the years has changed. Heavyweights are bigger, but a lightweight 1909 was a, is the same weight 135 as it is now. 1920 in middle is 160. The difference is, and Bruce will see this in his gym, a middleweight six foot tall today. Harry Greb is five foot eight. A lightweight is five foot nine today, more or less. A lightweight then was five foot three. So the the, the way the, the the weight was uh, you know distributed around the body was different. These guys were short, stocky guys built to go fifteen rounds, twenty rounds. Different kind of a fight. It was almost like a football scrimmage, you know, like a rugby scrub uh, scrum when you got into there. They weren't really boxing all out like Ali and Frazier. That would, wouldn't be impossible. Somebody would have got knocked out, and that would have been it. They were more endurance tests, and more endurance on the fan I had to sit there for three and a half hours watching two guys. Well, this is sort of a non-boxing question, but it is a boxing. Next year in March is the Ali Frazier 50. It's also a hundred years of boxing. Uh, do you think that we, do you think the country will be open in a way that we could give the full benefit to these events? March seems far away, but what do you think? Do you think we're gonna be out there in March celebrating these amazing events? Well, it's special to me because I was at the first Ali Frazier fight sitting in the last row. You how shouldn't, I got the you shouldn't dollars. The committee. Okay. Uh, uh, quick quiz, okay? Uh, my seat was the cheapest, $20. Uh, guess what ringside went for? I know this one, so go ahead, Jack. You tell him. Okay, Don knows. Uh, Bruce, Larry, you want to take a guess on ringside, what, what it went for? $150. You got it. Okay, there you go. $150. And, uh... Yeah, that's that's quite amazing. Yeah. Well, Jill, Jill, real quick, uh, back to the thing about the round. So I've heard Clarissa Shields, and she talks about it as an equality issue fighting for three rounds over two rounds. But I was at the, uh, I think it was the Amanda Serrano fight, and Luda Bella went on a very passionate um, diatribe at the post by press conference where he was saying that any of us that are talking about three minute rounds were basically that we're just horrible people that you know you're talking about their their brains and he went on a whole diatribe that I could not explain right now on why mm -hmm. women should be doing two minutes as opposed to three minutes for medical reasons. Right. Well, you know, most a fighter is like an actor. Give me my close up. Most fighters will do whatever they need to do. And it's not a, to us, it's not a sexist issue. It's a scientific issue. Um, it's not about, it's, it's about physiology based on scientific research. And our opinion can change if that research does change. So the goal right now is to collect correct contemporary research and make an informed decision about whether this rule for women should change. Well, I mean, somebody could present the argument, well, we can prevent any brain damage for women in boxing. Let's not let women box. Of course, you can say that for men too. Right, you want to be abolitionist. You want to stop any injury, but you're going to have injuries if it's two minutes, one minute, three minutes, six minutes. You may have more, obviously. Absolutely. Well, I've, I've made the argument, and it's always get, getting shot down for headgear, 
okay? Uh, you know, a light fitting headgear that, you know, could be a designer type and it just doesn't go over well. But I, I think it I would think be with, the, with the headgear, the, the fighters use it for a, a false sense of protection. You know, they, they think they can take a punch. I see it in sparring all the time. They think they, because they're wearing headgear, they can go in there and, and brawl more and, and take punches. And the, the headgear doesn't protect you from a, a punch to the head. It, it protects you if you fall, you might not uh, get, get cut. Uh, it might protect you, your eye. Uh, but if your head is inside of a, uh, uh, a headgear and you get it walloped, uh, your head, your, your, uh, your brain is going back and forth uh, anyway. So I, I think the fighters use it for a false sense of protection, and I'm not I'm not for it. Believe well, me, you sparred there. I, you you feel you feel it for sometimes weeks at a time if you get hit hit hard when you're in the headgear. So that's definitely true. I always thought it was almost more of a protection for cuts because cuts become very important if you become a pro. But if that's the case, if it does help and a fight is less likely to get cut during the fight, then both contestants have more of a chance to exhibit their skill. How many fights have we seen where a fighter gets cut early in the fight and then his fight plan goes out the window and it affects him the rest of the way? Right. Here's well, a question I have. Should women be allowed to have a handicap and fight men? So, for example, should a lightweight woman be allowed to fight a flyweight man? Should a middleweight woman be allowed to fight a lightweight man? It wouldn't appeal to me, but I, I'm not going to judge it. I'm not basically for it, but. I don't think so. I, I don't think that society today can, you, you wouldn't be able to watch a man hit a woman and, and just. No. Well, let me, let me, let me tell you something. Imagine Clarissa Shields at the top of her game in her prime against an out of shape Adrian Broner. Could you imagine the build up to that match, the words that are going to be used? No, but let's so say Alyssa Shields against a Ricardo Lopez is a better analogy. She'd have a 25 pound weight advantage. Well, Ricardo Lopez is a great, great fighter. All right, but he was 105 pounds and Clarissa Shields is how much? 135? I don't even know her weight class. Her, her weight varies. What does she weigh in fighting? Goes up and down. Well, what is she basically? She's not she, 300 pounds. No, she goes up and down. Well, more or less, what is the weight? Give me any weight, arbitrarily. I right? mean, in the 140s, I would 140. say. Well, uh, she had a 35 pound uh, weight. No, no, 150. Yeah, in the 150. 150s, right. I think. There's a 54 and 0 mini flyweight champ of the WBC from Thailand. What's his name? I don't know his name. He's 54 and 0. Should that guy, should Clarissa Shield be allowed to fight him and who would win? Well, why? Why not? Because it's boxing. Well, women want to play on football. There's girls who sue to get on the football team with men. There's girls who sue to play on the hockey team. You can't tell me that's not a contact sport. It's a cheap I want equality. Equality is equality. Uh, I, I see it here in, in the gym at the very light waist, up to 105, maybe 110 pounds. Right. The women can go in there and ha and, and handle them uh, themselves with the men. Right. Once they once they get higher than that, then the physiology comes in, and and the men are, are just too strong at the same weight. But the, the lightweights, the the women are just as good as the men. But Bruce, what I'm asking is, could a lightweight woman, the best lightweight woman, Calista Shields, fight this 105 pound man? Would that be an equal match? Who wins, theoretically? The best 105 man against the best 135. She's got the advantage. She got 30 pounds on. Could that be? I think that's a provocative match. I'd like to see it. Is she so disadvantaged? Women want to play on they they sued and got the right to play on football teams with men. They sued and gotten the right to play on hockey teams with men. I'm saying you give her a 30 pound advantage. Does that equalize it, Joe? They they sued and got the right to box. That's it. Now they box men. So is that uh, is that sexist? No, I I don't. Well, right now it's against the law. At least well, it's against the law. Change the law. It was against the law for women to vote at one time. I somehow we made the mistake and allowed them to vote. But you know, we did it. We didn't revoke that law. We can oh. change. We can any law can be changed. You know, we can write. <laughs> we can like say there should have been eleven commandments. One was missing. Let's add it on. This country is based on changing laws. That's why I have twenty-seven amendments of the Constitution. Far more interested in two but, versus three women fighting men. I'm just saying that's my own. But what would, ha in your opinion, though, physically? Would 135, the best 135 pound woman be able to beat the best 105 pound man? I don't know. Well, there you go. Uh, well, so women haven't had as good of an amateur background because they're not nearly as many bodies. women in boxing as men. So a world champion, a man, you know, he would have had a lot, a lot of amateur. Well, that's, that's, 135 that's, pound, 135 you know, pound. And then, 
that is changing because I organize the WBC amateur leagues. You go to some of these uh, amateur tournaments, Sugar Bird tournament, uh, Beautiful Brawlers tournament, the beautiful 70, there are so many young women now in the amateurs. It's unbelievable. And they've started very young. They take it very seriously. So right. now the well, whole- you know, in the early years when women boxing first became a regular thing, the women didn't fight too well in the beginning because they didn't have an amateur background. They were learning as professionals, but now you see the women boxing very polished, you know, just like the men, no, no difference. So I'm saying with a handicap, with a weight handicap, would that be amazing? They're all, the women have boxed well, men, that has happened. Listen, right? I mean, Floyd Mayweather, you put, you know, at his peak, you put him up against world rated heavyweights. He would beat some of them despite the big weight at disadvantage. Correct. But some he wouldn't. No. Right. Yeah, well, he would beat some. I mean, wouldn't have beaten not Mike Tyson. Are you going to tell me? You think he would have beaten Mike Tyson? No, no. Uh, I'm uh, saying uh, some of the other world-rated, you know, fighters. I'm taking it back. Frazier, Ali, one, two, and three. Which was your favorite? One. One. I was at the first one, and it was my greatest thrill in boxing. On the committee, Jack. What about you guys? One, two, three. One. Which was a favorite of yours? One. one. One, one of the greatest event I've ever been to in my life. Yeah, fabulous. A great fight, a great fight as well. I don't think we're going to see Ted today, and I think we lost Victor also. I don't know where they are. They're floating around in internet space somewhere. So is there anything anybody else would like to add or say or bring up at this point? Yes, I want the petition, two petitions from Bruce. One is that we get this going with everybody signs, set something up on the internet, we'll get everybody to start soliciting them. And two, I want a petition to change the name of Gleason's Gym to Silverglades Gym. It's about time it's named after you. You're the institution, you created this gym. Bobby Gleason was never even at that gym. You're the man made this alive. You kept it going through every kind of obstacle and every kind of adversity, and damn it, your name should be on that gym. Thank you, I appreciate that, but but it's known for, uh, for Gleason's. People from around the world come in because of Gleason's Gym. If I change it to Silverglades Gym, uh, I wouldn't get half the people, but thank you. Thank you. Back. You're underestimating yourself. Thank you for trying, Victor. I, I assume Ted is not joining us. Victor? Yes, it, well, we tried everything with Ted, but his computer <laughs> didn't detect the microphone, so he couldn't connect. Well, we'll have to do a Ted show then, because just so people know, Ted Sayers was supposed to come on. He is the oldest powerlifter. He has a four-time grandmasters in the uh, European powerlifting. He's in, been in strongman contests. He's a fabulous, fabulous writer. And he's, what, 85, 88 years old, something like that, and still going strong. Do we have any pictures of Ted? I sent some in, Victor. Can, do they have a picture? Pueden poner algunas fotos de Ted, por favor, producción. A bit of representation. They're, they're going to do it now. Great. We just want, this is what we're missing, folks. And he also, by the way, like Don, is one of the most unedited people in boxing ever. I'm one of the most uneducated people in boxing. <laughs> this is Ted with one of his right. <laughs> Do we have another one? There he is. If you want to be average, do what others do. If you want to be awesome, do what no one does. That is the world's oldest mm. power lifter, Ted Sayers, whose writing is extraordinary. So we'll catch up with Ted in another time. There yeah, he is, I, getting ready to getting ready to lift. I just spent uh, fifty-two minutes with him on the phone, and he's a great guy, you know. You're gonna have to figure this one out and bring him in somehow, huh? Yeah, I gave him some options, so he might try with a headset or something else next time. Okay. Well, right. Let me go, let me compliment the WBC for having this show you've had it continuously during the pandemic and it you're doing a great service to boxing by you know keeping the sport going you know during this difficult time so a big thanks to the wbc thank you jack and and victor's done it twice a day oh victor <laughs> a, a double thank you to you victor it's a pleasure to have people like you learn from uh, great people so Bruce, we got to get your gym open. That's what we're coming yes. up with. That's our takeaway from this talk. Okay. Yes. Getting the New York gyms open for professional boxers. Yes. Absolutely. Great. So 
Victor, do you have- what about the amateurs? Do you guys have any thoughts on when the amateurs might be able to come back and when sparring and that kind of stuff may uh, come back? Or are we just that's uh, we're, we are, we have no uh, advice, uh, no no hint from the government uh, when gyms can open, uh, particularly boxing gyms, and there's no guidelines set at the moment. So we're uh, we're really flying in the dark. I don't know, you know, but you you know, I, I didn't bring. Um, the amateurs into my uh, my conversations uh, uh, because we're it's professional and, and the government was only talking about professionals, but the amateurs are are quite a bit uh, taken aback also because there are national championships coming up later in the year and if you're in a, if you're in Georgia where you can train or you're in one of the states where you can train you have a hell of an advantage over a kid living in New York that can't train, Absolutely. so you know it's it's just as important for the gyms to open for amateurs as as well as the pros. Actually, with the Olympics having been postponed, it's it's really important to them. Anyway, anyone have anything else to say to wrap it up? I think. Thank you. Out, Bruce. Yeah. Bruce, you were going to. Do it again. What? Let's do it again. Yes, let's start the petition. Let's do it right. Ted in. We got to get Ted in. Victor. I just want to thank you. Uh, I was listening to you. I know this is a very important uh, issue in, in New York. And the, the thing that people need to realize as soon as they open the shows, their fighters need uh, to be ready so yeah. they can get hurt. It's not like, I, I love basketball. You can hurt a knee or an ankle and just be out for three weeks. But in boxing, you're risking your life. You have to be in shape. It's not a game. So. Let's do everything we can do to open the, the gyms and get the fighters ready. And Bruce, if people want to write you and support you, where, where should they write you so you can maybe put together a bunch of letters and petitions and stuff like that? What would be a good email? Just Bruce at Gleason'sGym.com. Bruce at Gleason'sGym.com. I would suggest to everyone who is not only interested in the sport, but interested in the safety and care of our athletes, Write those letters to Bruce to support him in getting the gyms open for professionals. And you media guys, you know, write whatever you can write, but the more people that know about it and can uh, and react to it, the better off we are. Well, that's why I wanted to ask Jack, what, what do you think that the media, the boxy media, um, can do to uh, help push the situation along? I mean, Bruce has a ton of contacts from Gleason, so it's a question, Bruce. So I'd reach out to individuals just to make one announcement on media, do so and so. I would target, you know, individuals of a great deal of respect here, you know, people like Mike Woods, so on. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'd be glad to do something. Mike, Mike's been very helpful. He's, he has written a couple pieces for me. Right, right. I mean, and the individuals, mm. but I think the craziness in society right at this particular moment everything that's going on, you know, with the protests and the pandemic. I don't think at this particular moment, no matter what's done, the governor's office is going to react, unfortunately. We've got to try. we got to try. we got to try and fail and not try at all. Right. Right. Unless, unless the fighters in particular, you have a news crew and they're a little embarrassed, or someone maybe threatens to, you know, take the... Uh, uh, you know, the gov uh, upstate New York, you know, the governor's office, the court over this, you know, certain athletes, because they're not allowed to practice their sport while they're allowing other sports to practice. It's discriminatory. You, know, you have to embarrass them, basically, to get them to do something. That's right. And the first boxer that gets hurt in the ring because he was not able to professionally work up for that fight. Exactly, exactly. That fear. Should the boxing people maybe join up with the MMA people who seem to be in a similar situation for this? 100%. You know, okay. you okay. look what I'm going to do, what we should all do, all us New Yorkers right now, is call our state, when we get up to call our state senator and state assembly person, each one has an individual and, and bring this up to them. That's the least we can do. That's the first thing. They can write a letter, but we start getting some politics and that's power. To change, I think it's a complete overstatement. I think they pump gyms in. They didn't think the professional gym. They think gym is the same. Somebody goes to do yoga. The exercise. Get me off the edge.
It's in the conversation. <laughs> so everybody, Victor, wrap it up for us, please. Thank you very much for being in the WBC Talk 58. We appreciate everything you do for boxing. And Jill, stay home, stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Commit. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jill. So Take much. Care, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.